Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman and it's time for your weekly wrap up and today we're going to be taking a look at a couple of different topics including the end potentially of Toys R Us here in the United States and perhaps throughout the world. We're going to look at some ways to emulate retro handhelds from archive.org. We're going to talk a little bit more about disclosures and how I uh, determine what to disclose in my videos. We're going to look at how FTC rules might apply to Canadian content producers like the Hardware Canucks. And I'm going to give you my uh, annual reminder about the differences between expensive laptops and middle of the road laptops and what each brings you. And it's not always performance. But before we get into all of this, I do want to thank our newest members here on the channel, including Darren Palmer, Vincent Terranova, Rich uh, Sirachman, and Michael Statham, who gave via the tip jar. I want to thank everyone for their contributions to the channel this week and everyone else who contributes on a regular basis, as well as all of you who watch on a regular basis, too, because all of those things equal channel growth. Now, we don't have a sponsor this week on the channel, but we do have a non-ad, an affiliate link to GearBest.com because they are having a sale on Xiaomi products like this one we reviewed a few months ago. This is their 13.3-inch uh, laptop. I believe there is a configuration of this on sale right now. Uh, full disclosure, of course, uh, GearBest sold me uh, this device at a discount for doing the review a little earlier in the year. Uh, so definitely check out the sale. Uh, we get a small portion of whatever you buy on there, and uh, Xiaomi has some really cool stuff that you can't get throughout most parts of the world, so you can uh, get them through GearBest. So let's take a look now at the week in review. On the Extras channel, we took a look at how to use an Epson printer with a Chromebook. I've been doing this with every major brand of printers. We also unboxed that 8-bit dough USB wireless adapter I reviewed the other day and unboxed a Lenovo ThinkPad X280. And then on the main channel, we had full reviews of all of those products you just saw on the Extras channel. And you can see all of that linked in the master playlist down below. And now it's time for a couple of things that are on my mind, and this is week number 54 of me doing this as a full-time occupation. And uh, we started up the Facebook group last week, and this has been a really successful first week for something like this. I've had a lot of people join the Facebook group. You can as well at lon.tv slash Facebook group. Had a lot of posts that were not just from me. A lot of you were posting things, and I'm seeing a lot of uh, community engagement where fans are talking to each other, which is a great thing, which is what I've been trying to do on my uh, own website and on Reddit and a few other places. It looks like the Facebook group here is uh, kind of the sweet spot for what you all are looking for. So I hope if you are uh, looking to engage with me and your fellow fans, head on over to the Facebook group. There's a lot going on there already. And now it's time for a couple of things in the news that caught my eye. And I wanted to show you something the Internet Archive just started doing. Uh, so one of the cool things that the Internet Archive initiated a few years ago was running MAME inside of a web browser. So they've been archiving old software and old arcade games and stuff and uh, keeping it in a safe place so that the world can still experience parts of electronic history. And now they have the ability through their MAME emulator uh, to emulate these little handheld consoles. And these are things that... I used to play with as a kid, and I wanted to show you how this works. It's actually pretty cool. Uh, so this is called Dribble Away Basketball. This is one of the 60 or so that are currently available. They, they will have more soon. They've been working out some of the kinks. This is a little game that I pay, played quite a bit uh, in the early 80s, and these really were the handheld video games of that era. There just wasn't anything like the, uh, the Game Boy, for example, in the early 80s. When the Game Boy came out in 1989, that was a big deal because you could actually play a real video game versus some of these uh, LED things or LCD things. Uh, so what this game is about is a basketball player here that has to get through these defenders. And you'll see they have their hands up in different spots. And what you had to do was uh, dribble the ball high, low, or medium, get through these guys, and then shoot the ball to score. And these little bars up here were your shot clocks. Let me start the game here real quick and just show you how this worked here. So we're going to try to get through these guys. Uh, and now that I've got, oops, I just lost the game. Now let me start again. Uh, you can see how really poor these games were. Um, but when this is the only game in town, literally, uh, it actually was a lot of fun to play. And I forgot how to play this, and the controls are a little uh, iffy here. Now, they also have some of the old Tiger Electronics games emulated on here. These were newer, and they licensed uh, actual console and arcade games. This is Altered Beast, and as you can see here, it is 
Uh, pretty lousy, actually. Uh, but this was the best we had then in the days before we had the Game Boy and some of the uh, popular handhelds that came out afterward. But uh, as bad as this is, this is a piece of computing history, and it's kind of nice to be able to uh, relive some of this stuff. That basketball game certainly has a place in my heart. There's a few others out there that Mattel Electronics had that I'm eager to try out when they make it to this thing as well. So I just thought this was pretty cool. And if you are a person of a certain age, like I am with all this cool stuff from the 80s behind me, uh, this might be a fun thing to check out. They will probably have your favorite electronic games up there soon. And in other nostalgic toy-related news, Toys R Us is going into liquidation probably in the next week or two here in the United States and this will also impact their international stores as well. Uh, this will be essentially the end of this iconic company, but the brand will live on in some way, uh, partly because the brand is one of the things that will be actually liquidated. People will want uh, this very well-known brand name to be their own thing, and I think they'll probably see this exist in some way, shape, or form uh, in the near future. Now, over the weekend, I took my daughters up to the Toys R Us that I used to shop at as a kid in Waterford, Connecticut. I believe this location was built in the mid to late 80s. And uh, this is the store uh, where I got that Sega Genesis back there, actually. It was really kind of funny because I was reading all of these new video game magazines that were coming out in the summer of 1989, and everybody was excited about the 16-bit revolution. And it was supposed to come out in like September, October or something, the Genesis there. Uh, but because I was in Connecticut, we were part of an early test market. So the Genesis actually came out earlier here. I think I got mine in like August of uh, 1989, maybe even July. So it was a very uh, early rollout for the Genesis at this store. Uh, and that is where I, I was able to get it after saving up my pennies. It was $189 back then. I picked up the Genesis console along with uh, alter, uh, Space Harrier with the Altered Beast uh, cartridge, of course, packed in with it. I also bought my first Game Boy there. And one of the cool things about Toys R Us back then is that they really had the biggest selection of video games you could find anywhere. Uh, when you walked into that store, they had a huge long aisle, maybe even two. I'm talking like the whole length or at least a good chunk of the length of the store of just the games. They had these little tags that were hung up and they'd have these little tickets beneath it that you could pick the ticket out and uh, take it up front to the register, pay, and then go to the lockup at the front to uh, get your game or console as you left. In fact, now that I think about it, I also bought my original Nintendo, 8-bit uh, Nintendo there as well. And it was such a fun place to go because again, you just did not have that selection anywhere else. Uh, this is one of the few places that I could actually buy a Sega Master System game at, for example, because most of my local department stores didn't carry any video games or just carried the most popular titles. Toys R Us had just about everything, and uh, they had quite a selection. But nowadays, the store doesn't uh, remind me of how it used to be. In fact, they carved up a good chunk of the store for uh, baby stuff because that, that stuff is more profitable. Things like cribs and formula and diapers and that sort of thing. So they really reduced the footprint for toys to the point where it didn't seem like there was a lot of selection there. And this store is not, was not in liquidation yet. This is just their regular course of business. And even my daughter just did not appreciate the selection they had at that store. I think she got more out of the Walmart down the street, uh, Super Walmart, that had a greater selection of toys, believe it or not, in my opinion, than uh, this Toys R Us did. So it really uh, kind of lost its luster. But let's take a look at why it lost its luster. So let's take a look at some of the things that led to where Toys R Us ended up today. So 20 years ago, in 1998, Toys R Us lost their place as the number one toy retailer in the United States. They were knocked out of that position by Walmart, uh, which was, of course, expanding rapidly and opening up larger stores with more selection. And as people were shopping for their household items at Walmart, they could also find all the hot toys for their kids. I think Walmart got aggressive not only with price, but uh, with exclusivity as well. So that started to put a dent into the business. And then, of course, as we uh, rounded the turn of the century, uh, e-commerce became a thing. And one of the mistakes I think Toys R Us did uh, was contract with Amazon to run their entire e-commerce operation. I don't think this lasted all that long, but it was long enough for Amazon to uh, take that partnership and learn how to sell toys online. And when the deal soured, Amazon just started selling toys themselves, and Toys R Us did not develop the expertise to sell those toys online themselves. And shareholders, I think, started getting a bit antsy here. And of course, those two pressures continued. Uh, so in 2005, 
Uh, Toys R Us, the public company, was acquired by a private equity group. And this was something called a leveraged buyout. And I've got a link down there below to the Financial Times where you can read more about this. And a leveraged buyout means that this private equity group bought all the shares of the company and became the owner of the company, but they saddled the company with the debt of the deal. So Toys R Us had a $5 billion uh, essentially credit card bill here to help pay for the purchase of itself. And that $5 billion became a real uh, issue for them over the next uh, decade or so because uh, they really couldn't invest in the business when they had to keep paying down these debt payments. And they also had to pay fees uh, to the private equity group for the management of the company. I think over the course of this uh, ownership, they probably paid out 100 or $200 million to the private equity group for them to operate. And this is partly why these stores have really uh, lost their luster because they couldn't invest in anything because most of their money went to paying down debt. So in 2017, they finally just had to declare bankruptcy because they were having to pay several hundred million a year uh, just to keep themselves from becoming insolvent. And uh, their sales were declining as well because of all this pressure from big box, from Walmart, from Amazon, and all the other pressures that they were under. And then, of course, the debt kind of sealed the deal in 2018 for them to go into liquidation. So what's next? Well, there is a healthy or more, more or less healthy Canada business here that's part of this company. And there's also a number of profitable U.S. stores. In fact, the store that I referred to at the beginning here, the one in Waterford, Connecticut, uh, was going to be one of the stores that would remain open uh, during this restructuring that they were going through or they were hoping to go through prior to declaring liquidation. And that store was profitable. And it looks like some of these profitable U.S. stores are going to get bundled with this Canada business and remain open. So I think we're going to see a lot of these stores liquidate but there will probably be some stores left over. And probably the best uh, analog to this might be what we saw with Radio Shack and that uh, Radio Shack got, I think is now part of some private equity group. And there are some Radio Shack stores that are remaining as real company stores. And there's other ones that are opening up as franchises under the Radio Shack brand uh, that will sell some items that they're bringing in with Radio Shack branded uh, items as well. So I think we're going to see this kind of model appear here that we'll see some company owned Toys R Us stores and then probably uh, some kind of franchise thing or some other arrangement where the brand will exist but it just won't be like we remembered it. But maybe uh, there might be a buyer that brings some passion back into this business and uh, really tries to build it up. In some of the articles I've been reading, uh, there's a, a brand, I think it's called MGA. Uh, they manufacture these LOL surprise dolls, which are my daughter's favorite things at the moment. You can look them up on YouTube to see what they're all about. And they are owed a lot of money by uh, the Toys R Us entity here. And they're one of the people that's looking to put together a group to buy this. You might actually see some toy manufacturers buy out the chain, uh, probably for fractions of a penny on the dollar to uh, maybe reinvigorate it. Because this really is, Toys R Us, an important part of the toy industry. Because toys are a very tactile thing. And I think people do, or especially kids, uh, want to test out the stuff they are looking to buy first in a store versus just blindly uh, buying it online. The biggest problem, though, with all of this is that there are a number of smaller companies that will likely also go bankrupt because they will never get their money back from Toys R Us. The secured creditors like the banks and uh, whoever these private equity people work with are going to get their money from this liquidation first. They probably won't get the whole $5 billion out of it, but uh, they're going to get paid before all of these other smaller companies will. I think we're going to see a lot of smaller toy companies go under as a result of this. But if you want to see a happier time in the Toys R Us existence, you can take a look at a playlist I've been putting together over the last couple of days, just finding some uh, little nuggets here and there on YouTube that I thought were pretty cool. Uh, the top of the list there is a video that somebody posted from an actual Toys R Us aisle in the early days of the Sega Genesis. So you can see exactly how they put these games up for sale, and they've got some good uh, sound in that video too, so you can hear what things used to sound like. Uh, Lazy Game Reviews has a, a little overview of a Toys R Us catalog from 1993. Uh, some of those display cards I talked about are featured in a video from the No Square Gamer where he shows you what those things look like. And I got a couple other things that I'll be adding to this playlist over time. So check it out if you want to see what it looked like when I was a kid shopping at Toys R Us. All right, so now that another piece of my childhood has died off, let's move on now to uh, some viewer Q&A. And this first question comes in from RJ Make, who
who's uh, talking about some of my disclosure policies I talked about last week on the channel. And he raises a good point here. He says, isn't any review where the product was knowingly given to the reviewer a paid review? The merchandise is payment, is it not? I think if the government expects us to pay income taxes on the retail value of the product, shouldn't this be considered a paid review? And this is a very good point because yes, Anything that you take in uh, from a manufacturer where they don't want the thing back at the end of it uh, is essentially income that has to be reported to the Internal Revenue Service here in the United States. Now, the threshold that I've put on this is that I look at this from the standpoint of my opinion and the editorial control that is put on the video. So let's use that 8-bit dough adapter that I got in last week. I mentioned in the video that it came in free of charge from 8-bit dough. They don't want it back, partly because the shipping, just to have them send it to me and then have me send it back to them, would probably cost more than the item does itself. So in many cases, they just send the stuff into us here and they don't want it back and we usually give it away somehow or I use it in here in the studio and declare it on my taxes or whatever. So I declared that, yes, the product came in for free, but I do say that there uh, is no one paying for the video because I am not doing an advertisement and I'm not receiving compensation uh, for producing the video beyond the fact that this product was sent to the channel free of charge. And uh, the other thing that comes with this is my policy that I fire back to the brands whenever they have questions because in many cases brands want certain things covered, but I don't operate that way. I tell them, look, I'm going to cover this the way that I think it should be covered. I'm going to look at the things that I think viewers will find important about this device. And by the way, you can't see this before it's uploaded loaded, nor can you give me any input on the video as I'm working on it, unless I have a question specifically about a feature or maybe something's not working right that I want some clarification on. But uh, I never, ever uh, in those circumstances allow a brand to tell me what to do, uh, nor do I give them the ability to see what I'm about to post before it's uploaded. There have been a few instances over the years where brands have not been happy with my opinion, but uh, I say, look, this is the deal. I mean, I, I am going to review this product separately and independently. And although you might think this product is great, the reality is for my view, it may not be so great. And uh, thankfully, those instances have been few and far between. But uh, that's the approach that I have taken with this. And I think from the disclosure standpoint, uh, the viewers can understand that, yes, the product came in here free of charge, but uh, this product is not being given to you as an advertisement or having some brand dictate the content to you. I did want to talk a little bit about FTC rules related to this because uh, there is a, a section of their endorsement guide uh, that you can find at the link there on screen about how larger news organizations can treat free products coming in. Because guess what, folks? CNET and all these other uh, large institutions get free stuff from manufacturers all the time. Sometimes it's an actual product. Sometimes it might be just some cool press pack that uh, has a bunch of t-shirts and some other stuff in there. But the reality is, is that even the big folks out there are getting free product in all the time. However, uh, because those organizations have the benefit of these firewalls between editorial and sales, as you can see here, the FTC says, if you're employed by a newspaper or TV station to give reviews, your audience probably understands that your job is to provide your personal opinion on behalf of the newspaper or television station. In that situation, it is clear that you did not buy the product itself, whether it's a book or a car or a movie ticket, but on a personal blog, such as a social networking page, the reader might not realize that the reviewer has a relationship with the company. And that is why these disclaimers are important uh, for the industry that I am in, again, because there's no firewall up between sales and me. And that is why those disclosures are important. But the bottom line here is that uh, a lot of big news organizations are getting stuff in free of charge all the time. They are not required to disclose that to you. Additionally, those reviewers, because those firewalls are up, also don't need to disclose to you that they may have had a past or current or potentially future sponsorship arrangement with that brand. I am required to do that again because I am a sole proprietor. So that's kind of the thought process that I took to this. Uh, let me know what you think down in the comments below. And in another follow-up question to last week's video, Northern Dirt was wondering whether or not the U.S. government would have any jurisdiction over a Canadian content creator. 
uh, because one of the videos that I pointed out in last week's video was one produced by Hardware Canucks where I thought they didn't properly disclose their relationship with the Dyson Vacuum Cleaner Company. Uh, now, the uh, questioner here is correct in the sense that the FTC could not find the Hardware Canucks if they are completely located in Canada. There's certainly no jurisdiction there, but Dyson the brand uh, might be on the hook here because uh, the Hardware Canucks are, are basically promoting the product to U.S. viewers by providing a, uh, a link to where U.S. Uh, viewers can buy the vacuum cleaner. So that is something that uh, people need to be uh, thinking about here, especially brands that are contracting with content creators. Even if that creator is overseas, maybe the creator doesn't get fined, but the brand might get hit with it because these videos are appearing in the United States. And of course, the brand is selling the product in the United States and presumably uh, set up the deal in the first place and was responsible for making sure that all proper disclosures are made. So it's important not only for uh, brands here to think about this, but of course the creators as well, even if they are outside of the U.S. jurisdiction. Another thing I want to point out here before we move on to the next slide is uh, it looks like they did add um, this line of text here saying that the product was provided free of charge by Dyson and the video was sponsored by Dyson. I don't recall seeing that uh, last week when I was talking about this. It looks like they added that line, but that's not enough to get yourself out of the FTC's uh, ire here because one of the things that they put up in that endorsement guideline is that just putting it in the description is not enough because consumers can easily miss disclosures in the video description, including anyone who watched that video on a television and anyone who did not click the show more link here, because if you just log in uh, to YouTube and don't click on show more, this is all you see. You don't even see the entire description here. You certainly don't see the affiliate links and you definitely don't see the disclaimer that they added uh, way at the bottom of their description. But there are similar guidelines in Canada for content creators located there. Uh, this is an article I found in the uh, CBC News from uh, August of 2016, where it looks like starting in 2017, uh, social media producers were required to begin properly uh, disclosing their paid endorsements, like the vacuum cleaner thing we just talked about. Uh, and it looks like the Competition Bureau in Canada uh, is the equivalent of the FTC here in the United States. And I would venture to say at some point they may start looking for people to make examples out of where they start handing out a few fines here or there to uh, begin getting the, the message out that people as a group need to start behaving better online or else. And uh, you don't want to be the one that gets the or else because it can be expensive and uh, certainly brands and uh, bloggers need to be aware of that. So if you are in Canada and many other countries, you would likely have similar guidelines that you need to abide by. And our channel of the week this week is one that I can't believe I haven't recommended before, but I could find no record of recommending this channel in the past. Maybe we should put together a spreadsheet of all of my prior recommendations now that we've got probably about a year's worth now. Uh, it is The Gaming Historian, one of my favorite channels. He doesn't post videos often, but when he does, they are mostly epic uh, experiences here. So his most recent video was uh, from about a day ago, uh, The History of Rob the Robot, which is what uh, I got in my NES box when I bought it at that Toys R Us store I just talked about. Uh, he also did a great video on the history of Tetris. It was an hour long, but well worth your time. And uh, he really does just great work and you should definitely watch him if you haven't before. So check out The Gaming Historian uh, that you can find at the link down below. So this week I've got a couple of fun things planned and I bought most of them in case you're wondering. Uh, the first item I purchased was this N30 arcade stick from 8-Bit Doe. When I was working on that review of their USB adapter, I saw this in the instruction manual. I said, what is that? I have to get this thing. So I went on Amazon and I thought I had purchased purchased it, but in fact, when I came back this weekend to see if I had, because it didn't show up at the door when I expected it to, turns out I never clicked through the checkout fully. And then the price on this went from $80 to about 50 bucks uh, in the course of the two days that it was just sitting in my shopping cart. So I got a pretty good deal on it. I hope that price sticks. I put a link to it uh, down below there so you can grab one too if you are looking for one of these things. And uh, what this is is an arcade stick that will work with the Switch. It'll work with many of the other devices that these 8-bit dough controllers are typically compatible with. So that'll be kind of fun. This is kind of a rebadge of another company's joystick, but that other one doesn't work over Bluetooth, whereas this one does. And I think you can also directly connect it. So we'll have a full review coming up of this one very shortly. 
I also bought the new Raspberry Pi B Plus, and I think I'm actually getting it this week. I will keep you posted on that. And uh, this leads to my question of the week for all of you, which is what would you like to see in a Raspberry Pi B Plus review? Because everybody gets these things, everybody reviews them. So I always wanna find some different thing I can look at or uh, something that you viewers want to see with it. So uh, let me know down below. If you haven't heard about the new Raspberry Pi, it is a uh, slightly faster version from the one that we had from about a year ago, the Raspberry Pi uh, B. And it also has a power over ethernet function, but that requires an adapter that isn't yet available. But when that comes out, we'll certainly do a follow-up video. So this thing will eventually be able to be powered uh, through its LAN cable, which I think is just awesome. So we'll see better performance out of this. And again, power over ethernet is another cool feature of it. So let me know uh, what you want to see from it in our Q&A for you this week. Now, if you want to help the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv support and make a monthly or one-time contribution to the channel. We also have our ongoing relationship with Plex, where if you sign up for Plex with no credit card required, just for that free account, we'll get a small commission from that. We get a slightly larger commission if you buy a Plex Pass, whether for yourself or for a gift, and you can follow uh, the links there to do just that. We have a couple of other channels you might want to take a look at. My extras channel, where I have unboxings and supplementary content. We have the podcast, where I have a monthly podcast episode where we do an interview or cover a topic in depth and then uh, put all of the audio versions of this show up there in case this is a little too long for YouTube for you. We also have my snippets channel where I pull out portions of this show and others to uh, get better search optimization. You can find it there on the screen. We also have my live stream archive at lon.tv slash live streams. We will be having one soon uh, once I get caught up on a few other things where we're going to try to hook up an external GPU uh, to one of those mini PCs I looked at recently. That's gonna be a fun one. So I will email all of you when I do that. Now, if you want to find out whenever I'm doing anything, you can click that notification bell on my YouTube channel to get a notification every time something gets posted or goes live on the channel. And we also have an email list you can find at lon.tv slash email that I very infrequently use. But uh, if you do want to get notified when I have a live stream coming up, that's another great way to do it. We have the Facebook page at lon.tv slash Facebook where I post things. It's kind of like the sort of two-way communication, but the better one now is the Facebook group that you have to join. But once you're in there, you'll be able to uh, very easily communicate with me and other fans of the channel. That's at lon.tv slash Facebook group. And then we have my store at lon.tv slash store where I sell the things that I purchased to review here on the channel. They're very lightly used, often with the original packaging and all the stuff that comes with it. Uh, you can find that at the link there. And whenever I update the inventory, I send out an email alert if you are subscribed to that list. So you can go to lon.tv slash store alert to get notified whenever, whenever something shows up in the store. So that's going to do it for this week's weekly wrap up. Thank you all for your continued support here on the channel. As always, please keep your questions and comments flowing to me down below in the comments section on the Facebook group and anywhere else you think I should see it. I greatly appreciate everything you're doing to help grow this channel. And we are certainly in a good trajectory now and hopefully we'll continue to grow. We just surpassed 170,000 subscribers this week, which was a great milestone. We're almost to 200,000. This is Lon Sybin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.tv supporters, including gold level supporters of the Black Eyed and Blues Music Hour podcast, Chris Allegretta, and Kalyan Kumar. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.